Please turn them in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6, verses 14 through 15. Ephesians 6, 14 through 15. The letter of Ephesians was written by the Apostle Paul to the Christians living in the capital city of Ephesus. Paul wrote this while he was under house arrest in Rome, not fun, and he wrote it to lay a solid doctrinal foundation for these believers so that they could then live out those doctrines for the glory of God. So you know the truth and then you live out that truth. We're now nearing the end of the application section of this letter, and it's been very good, and it's been very challenging, and the call is to rise to the challenge for the glory of God because we love Him and because He is worthy. Recently, Paul's been imploring us to be spirit-filled Christians who do the will of God as found in the Word of God. That's seen in many practical ways, and it should radically affect how we live out our lives on a daily basis, knowing that God is watching. Back in verse 10, if you remember, Paul shows us that we in Christ are in a spiritual battle. And the call is to stand strong in the battle. The call is to put on the full spiritual armor of God every day and to wage a good warfare against the devil, our enemy. Last time, Paul began to show us how to do this by talking about three pieces of our spiritual armor. And today, Paul continues to talk about our essential spiritual armor armor. So let's go ahead and look at what he says. And we'll begin in verse 10 just for context. Verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, Take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God. Now, please remember that the call here is very clear to stand with all the armor of God. And this is just by way of review. Stand with all the armor of God. Standing is mentioned three times in this passage, and this is indeed a call for every true believer. The word stand conveys the idea of digging in and of holding your position. It means that you hold your ground and that you don't give an inch of territory to the enemy. The picture here is of a soldier in battle digging in, standing strong, and then fighting well. So standing isn't just a casual kind of standing, no, but it's a digging in and holding your ground and then waging a good warfare as the battle is raging around you. See, it's a picture of immovable steadfastness in the face of a relentless and ruthless foe. So who's our foe? Who is our enemy? Our enemy that we are called to stand against is the devil himself and the demons who follow after him. And look, the devil, he utterly hates you. He wants to devour you. He wants to destroy you, and he will do whatever he can to make that happen. And please remember that he's wily. Remember Methodia, verse 11? He's wily. The word describes deliberate planning and a systematic approach to devouring you. So he uses cleverness, craftiness, cunning, and deception. He wants to defeat you, discourage you, and dishearten you. And remember, he has a file on you, and he knows exactly what works on you. Thus the need for the armor. Now please remember that the battle is spiritual, not physical. That we wrestle against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. That means that this spiritual battle that every Christian is in, it's not a game. That our conflict is intensely serious, that we are in a bitter struggle against an unseen but very real enemy, that we are all involved in hand-to-hand combat against an enemy who wants to ruin us, and he's a cheater, and he doesn't follow the rules. See, we in Christ are soldiers in war, and we are wrestlers in a battle to the death, and that's all of our realities as Christians. This is, this is, 
what we have to deal with. The call then, and it's a privilege to deal with it, by the way. It's a privilege to wrestle and to fight against the wicked one. The call then, to stand with all the spiritual armor on every day because that's how we fight. And remember, we can fight and we can fight well and we can stand firm and strong. How? In him and in the power of his might. And that's key. So good news that while we ourselves can't stand against the devil and his demons in our own power, not a chance, look, the source of our strength doesn't come from ourselves, praise the Lord, but the strength and the power and the might comes from God, and that changes everything. See, every Christian already has God the Holy Spirit indwelling him, and also God has given us everything that we need to stand firm and to wage a winning battle. The key then is to hook up to the power source, to plug in and utilize the power that's already available to us, but how? Put on the armor. All of it, every day, no exceptions. The picture here is of a fully armored Roman soldier, and Paul uses this physical picture to show us the spiritual reality. And even though a Roman soldier wore other essentials for war, Paul chose chose to focus on six indispensable items, the belt, the breastplate, the shoes, which we looked at last time, and then the shield, the helmet, and the sword. And then after that, he added a seventh non-clothing item, prayer, which completes the full outfit for any spiritual soldier. Now, let me remind you of the first three pieces of spiritual armor. First, if you remember, the waist. So, If you remember, a girded waist, which consisted of a belt or a sash, was essential for every serious Roman soldier. Why? Because on that belt was strips of leather that hung down and protected the thighs. The belt was also the place where any weapons could be attached, such as a sword or a knife. The belt would also have some identification marks on it, most likely indicating what battles the soldier had fought in and what battles he had won. And then finally... The belt was the piece of armor that was used to tuck that tunic up into, which allowed for greater freedom of movement so that the soldier could move with speed and with dexterity and be the best soldier that he absolutely could be. So, in a very real sense, the belt was the emblem of battle. See, when you put that belt on, that meant that you were now prepared for the battle at hand. So, what is our spiritual belt that we are to gird and to, and to tighten around our waist? Truth. Now, it seems that here Paul isn't speaking of the content of truth, which is the word of God, because that's our sword. But instead, this is speaking of truthfulness and of the commitment to that truth. So it's not so much content here as it is commitment. So the picture is this. You know the truth and you believe the truth and you love truth the truth that's found in the word of God. So you're saved, you're truly saved, and you're now ready to fight for the truth. And that's the idea going on here. That speaks of sincerity, dedication, readiness, conviction, commitment, and preparedness. See, you're all in, right? You're not indifferent, not indifferent. You're not divided. You're not half-hearted. No, you're all in Because you know and believe the truth, and that then compels us forward. See, we know the truth about God and about ourselves and about heaven and hell and about salvation and the things that that truly matter. Therefore, we are compelled and convicted to live that out with passion and with fervor. Christ is everything, right? We understand that. That's the truth. Nothing else really matters but Christ. That's the truth. This life is fading and fleeting, but the things of God last forever. That's the truth. Christ alone saves and Christ alone satisfies. That's the truth. We get it, see? So you know these truths and and now you're all in. That's your belt. That's your belt. The second piece of armor that was essential for the Roman soldier was the breastplate. The breastplate covered the soldier from neck to waist, front, and back. It protected his heart and other vital organs, and it was usually made of bronze. What then is our spiritual breastplate? Righteousness. I believe this is speaking uh, about the two aspects of righteousness, about the imputed righteousness of Christ that we all receive at salvation, and then the necessity for us to live 
the Christian life, the righteous life, the God-pleasing life more and more and more. Look, we're all wrong because we're all sinners. But to get to heaven, you need to be made right with God. You need to be righteous, pure, holy, and unstained. Okay, how? Well, there's only one way. See, it's a gift from God to the repentant and believing sinner. It can't be earned, but it's credited. It's imputed to the believer at the moment of true saving faith. As 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him who knew no sin, Jesus, to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So our sin as believers that condemns us is credited to Jesus, which he took and paid for in full on the cross. And good news, his righteousness, his perfect life is credited to us as believers, and that is indeed the ultimate trade-off. And now, for every true believer, we are now declared righteous by grace through faith in Christ alone because of what he did in our place as our substitute on the cross. And that is an incredible reality for every true Christian. That's a piece of our armor as believers. How so? Well, when you fail, anybody? (laughs) When you stumble and bumble along, when you sin and you mess up and you blow it and when you feel so guilty you you, you want to wallow around in your sin and you want to wallow around in your guilt here's what you do you fall back onto that breastplate Christ died for all my sin he paid all my wages and I am in him see that's what you do so you put on the breastplate of the imputed righteousness of Christ as your defense against all Satan's lame accusations Along with that, we're also called to live the righteous and Christ-honoring life more and more and more. See, spiritual warriors are fighting sin. They're repenting much. They're pursuing Christ actively. They're not courting sin. They're seeking to obey. They're seeking to please the Lord. And that pursuit is a spiritual breastplate that protects us from the onslaught of the wicked one. The third piece of our spiritual armor that we looked at last week is our footwear. See, the sandals of a Roman soldier were made primarily from leather. They were light and airy, which allowed their feet to breathe and to stay cool and dry. But best of all, they were fitted with metal spikes on the bottom of the soles. Those spikes helped them to maintain their footing, and they allowed the soldiers to stand firm in the battle. Well, our essential footwear in the spiritual battle that we're all in is the preparation of the gospel of peace. What's the gospel? The gospel is the good news of Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. How good is that? That's good news, right? That's true good news. Think about this. Jesus, God the son, left heaven, came here, took on human flesh, lived a perfect life, died on the cross as a believer's substitute for sin, and then he rose up from the dead three days later, ensuring forgiveness and life for all who believe. And that is the best news ever because none of us deserves this. Using biblical terms, he adopted us. He redeemed us. He set his eternal love on us. He made us who believe his beloved children, his heirs. And we have heaven and him as our eternal inheritance when it's the last thing that any of us deserve. That means everything. (sighs) True peace at last. True peace at last. Peace with God. And for all true believers, the incredible peace of God. How's that a piece of our armor? Here's the thought. If God be for us, who can now be against us? See? So when Satan and life try to knock you down and cause you to flee instead of stand strong, when worries and fears surround you, when you fall and fail and mess up big time, when you're at your wit's end and you're scared and you're worried for a loved one or for yourself and you begin to waver, you put on the shoes and you remember the gospel of peace, remember the good news of Christ, remember Christ and the cross and what that means, remember the great love that God has for you because when you do that, it'll raise you above all those worries and fears and it'll give you perspective that will allow you to continue fighting, and to continue standing for another day. The next piece of armor that Paul mentions is the shield. The shield referred to here isn't a a small round shield, but rather this is talking about the large 
four-cornered shield that was about four feet by two and a half feet. And that was large enough to cover all the other armor and that allowed the soldier to stand be behind this shield fully protected. The shield consisted of two layers of wood that was glued together. It was then covered with linen and animal hide, and then it was bound with iron. Soldiers often fought side by side with a solid wall of shields protecting them. One soldier, after a certain battle, counted no less than 220 arrows sticking into his shield. Think about that. So a shield was absolutely essential for any soldier. What's our shield? Faith. Faith. Above all, or besides all this, or along with all these other pieces of armor, what? Take up the shield of faith. So this is talking about, uh, is this talking about saving faith, or is this talking about living out your faith with faithful living? Well, since the gospel is mentioned in verse 15, I believe that the shield of faith here refers to actively trusting in God, talking about faithfulness. After Peter warns his readers about their adversary, the devil, who wants to devour them, look what he writes in 1 Peter 5, 9. But resist him, what? Firm in your faith. So faith is vital for all of us if we're going to stand against the devil and resist him and wage a good warfare. So we're already saved by faith, <clears throat> and now we're called to live out our faith day by day by day, trusting him and living faithfully for his glory. So the question is, do you really trust him? I mean, really. Do you really take him at his word, which is truth? Do you really, truly believe what he says? Look, when we're successful, Satan tempts us with pride, seeking to turn us from God because we think that we no longer need him. That's a faith issue. When we suffer, Satan tempts us with doubt and unbelief, <clears throat> trying to make us believe that God has abandoned us so that we will then abandon God. It's a faith issue. But those who use their shield of faith, they will endure and overcome and remain faithful through it all and never give up and never give in because they trust God through it all. That's faith, right? I, I trust you, Lord. I'm not going to believe those lies. I, I trust you, Lord. I, I'm not going to be shaken by what's going on around me. No, I trust you, Lord. See, John MacArthur says that the way to stand strong and to resist the devil is by remaining firm in the faith. That means that you continue to live in accord with the truth of God's word. And as the believer knows sound doctrine and obeys God's word, Satan is then withstood. See, it's a faith issue. It's a trust issue. Think about it. You've trusted him with your very soul. Can't you now trust him with your life day by day by day? I mean, the future is sure as a believer, right? God is good. The best is yet to come, and our call is to trust the Lord to the very end, whether by life or by death. Trust him and walk day by day by faith. J. James gives us this advice. To live and walk by faith is to come daily to Jesus in the exercise of fresh dependence, fresh expectations, and fresh devotedness. To live and walk by faith is to see more of his glory and grace continually and to rejoice greater in his unsearchable riches and inexhaustible fullness. To live and walk by faith is in all our conflicts, sins, fears, weaknesses, and woes to resort afresh to Jesus with a full persuasion that we are welcome and thus ever to derive strength and courage from him. He says, every act of the spiritual life is an act of faith. Every step of the spiritual walk is a step of faith. The Christian's course is not only merely doing, but of believing. Faith is the eye which looks to Christ. Faith is the foot which moves to Christ. Faith is the hand which receives Christ. Faith is the mouth which feeds upon Christ. And that is our call as good spiritual soldiers. Trust him. Trust him. Stay faithful, for that is our shield. Look, our faith is in God and in what he says, right? We assert that God has spoken to us, and while God hasn't told us everything that there is to know, he's told us enough about truth and salvation and life and 
We put our trust in him, the God who created all, the God who knows all, the God who never lies, the God who is truth. We trust him with our souls, and we are to trust him with our daily lives. See, An example of this is seen in the lives of three Hebrew young men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel chapter 3. These were three men of God who refused to bow down to Nebuchadnezzar's idol, which caused the offended king to threaten them by throwing them into the blazing furnace. Their response shows us that in that moment, they took up their spiritual shield. See, by faith, they saw the unseen God as more real than the enraged king standing in front of them, threatening to roast them alive. Their answer shows forth their faith in the unseen God. They said, oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of, uh, uh, of blazing fire, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not, see, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods and worship the golden image that you have set up. See, that, that is true faith lived out. And that's the call. It's to be faithful and to trust God like that in the daily instances of our lives because that is our shield. Trust him. You may think, that's a great story, but what if uh, God hadn't delivered them? What if they had been burned to death? So what? So what? Then they simply would have died in faith and God would reward them abundantly throughout eternity in heaven. See, the key isn't the outcome. We trust God with all that. The key is their faithfulness in the midst of their trials and temptations. A.W. Pink uses the analogy of two men standing on the deck of a ship looking in the same direction. One sees nothing, but the other man sees a distant steamer. The difference is this, that the first man is looking with the unaided eye, whereas the second man is looking through a telescope. Well, faith is the telescope which brings the future promises of God into present focus. Faith enables us to see the unseen world that the natural man can't see, which then enables us to live with that in view, which then enables us to be propelled forward day by day. What's the call? Use your shield, or here, always be looking through the telescope. Look, when you do that, when you truly put your trust in God and live that out in your daily life, look, this will then allow you to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one. What a picture. It's a picture of Satan, the wicked one, literally the destructive one, the exceeding harmful and vicious one. And look, he's constantly hurling incendiary missiles or fiery darts or flaming arrows at us, at you. Constantly. So you better always have your shield up. See, at that time, the arrows of the enemy were often dipped in pitch and then ignited. Without a shield to deflect, absorb, and to quench the flaming arrows, well, you're going to get stuck and you're going to get burned up quite easily. Now, although these shields were made of wood and then covered in canvas and leather, look, before the battle in which uh, a flaming arrow might be shot at them, the soldiers would wet the leather covering the shield with water so that they would extinguish those flaming arrows. See, the Roman soldiers could close ranks with these shields, with the first row holding their shields edge to edge in front, and then with the rows behind holding those shields above their heads. So in that formation, they were practically invulnerable to arrows, rocks, spears, and even flaming spears. The shield was absolutely vital. Faith is our spiritual shield against all of Satan's fiery arrows. What are those fiery darts or fiery arrows? They're anything that will cause you to lose faith in the Lord and take your eyes off of him. Anything that will do that. Anything that will cause you to waver, to not stand firm, to not put on all your armor, doubts, fears, worries, temptations, and so on. You're horrible. How could God ever forgive you for what you have done? You say, well, nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's faith. God has abandoned you. You are all alone. 
No, never, never. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. See, it's faith. God doesn't love you anymore. He hates you. I mean, look at all the hardships you've gone through. If God really loved you, then all would be well in your life. Nope. In this life, we face trials and we face sufferings, but joy comes in the morning and the eternal weight of glory far outweighs all of life's hardships. Faith is the issue. You won't last. You will one day fall by the hand of the enemy. You say, no, for he who has begun a good work in me will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. It's faith. You're weak. Yeah, I am, but my strength is made perfect in weakness, and he's strong. And I believe in him. Faith. Your confidence and faith in the Lord is all in vain. And soon your hope will be cut off. No. God has not ever forsaken me. And his word is true. And I've never seen the righteous forsaken. And he will indeed take me to glory. Faith. See how it works? When you trust God and remain faithful, when this fast and fading life is hitting us hard... And when Satan is shooting his fiery darts at us, that's a shield. Faith is a shield that allows us to stand in this great battle that we are in. We've got to trust him. Don't believe the lies. Believe the word of God. You trust him. And even when you can't trace his ways, you can trust his heart. Because he is for you. And he loves you as precious child. And he will never leave you nor forsake you, and he keeps all his promises, every single one of them, so stay faithful no matter what. Satan hates it, and God loves it, enough said. That's a shield. Next comes a helmet. There were two types of Roman helmets. One was made of leather, and the other was made of metal. These helmets had a band to protect the forehead and and plates for the cheeks, and they extended down in the back to protect the neck. When the helmet was strapped into place, it exposed very little besides the eyes, the nose, and the mouth. The metal helmets were lined with sponge or with felt, and virtually the only weapons which could penetrate a metal helmet were hammers or axes. A helmet was absolutely essential for any Roman soldier. I mean, a Roman soldier who lost his helmet, man, he was in danger of receiving severe injury. And any Roman soldier who, who would be Foolish enough to enter the battle without his helmet on is, is, is on a death wish. I mean, it's utter folly to do that. Well, as Christians, our spiritual helmet is salvation, which describes the act of delivering or saving from great danger or peril. And here, the salvation is from eternal peril in hell. Christ alone gives that eternal salvation, deliverance, and rescue for all who believe because of who he is and because of what he did on that cross when he paid the wages of all our sin as believers in our place, as God's wrath against all that sin was poured out onto Christ so that we who believe could be saved, forgiven, cleansed, justified, and fitted with the righteousness of Christ by which we can now enter into heaven forever by grace, through faith, in Christ alone. How good is that? Salvation. Life, life, eternal life, with God and his people forever. That said, most believe that the salvation that Paul is talking about here as our helmet isn't our past salvation that happened when we were first saved and and when we first believed. Instead, this is talking about our future salvation, about the full culmination of our salvation as believers that we will experience soon in glory. So we are saved, and every Christian can stand in the calm confidence that the death of Christ has indeed saved him, that the resurrected Christ is keeping him, and that the coming Christ will preserve him safely throughout eternity. And that is our confident hope. And that hope is something that protects us like a helmet in this spiritual battle. As the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 6.19, this hope we have as an anchor for the soul both sure and steadfast. So it's talking about the hope that every Christian has in what lay ahead, our future culmination of our salvation, about that which is waiting for us in glory. Note that our hope isn't like the world's definition of hope, I hope so, which rarely happens. No, our hope as Christians is an absolute assurance of future good 
It's a confident expectancy. It's an unconditional certainty because the God who cannot lie has promised its reality to all of us, his beloved children. So we rest in that and we cling to that. And look, it gives us strength right now knowing what lies ahead. One said, biblical hope is not a hope so, but it's a hope sure. And that's absolutely right. And this is a piece of our spiritual armor that Satan hates. Now look, the writer of Hebrews says that this hope for us in in Christ is an anchor for the soul, and that's some strong imagery. See, the main reason you need an anchor is to keep from drifting into things that would destroy you, especially during storms. But our hope in Christ steadies the soul. It steadies us in our walk of faith. See, we won't drift if we cling to Christ our hope. See? Because with hope, we can maintain an optimistic outlook even when things go wrong. I mean, our life will still have its stresses and it will still be filled with trials and tragedies, but the believer whose hope is in the Lord won't be overcome because our hope is something that carries us through. One said that hope is something as important to us as water is to a fish, as vital as electricity is to a light bulb, and as essential as air is to a jumbo jet. Hope is basic to life. Without that needed spark of hope, we are doomed to a dark, grim existence. Take away our hope, and our world is reduced to something between depression and despair. And that is where the world is without Christ today. But because we have Christ And because we are saved and have heaven as our eternal inheritance, future salvation, see, hey, we can endure all this. We can even be joyful in the midst of this. We can smile even through our tears knowing what lies ahead because this isn't the end of the story. No, the best is yet to come and that propels us forward. Look, we face numerous types of storms that threaten to rob us of our hope in Christ. There are storms of false doctrine that can blow us off course. We must weather those storms by holding firmly to the promise of salvation in Christ alone, by grace alone, through faith alone. Put on that helmet. There'll be storms also of doubt sometimes, but we can weather those storms by coming back to the truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which is the bedrock of our faith. He's alive And our future salvation is certain and our hope can rest confidently in him. Put on that helmet. There will also be storms of difficult trials where we wonder why God is allowing them. And we question maybe whether he even loves us. We weather those storms by remembering that God, who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for all of us, he has promised to bring us through every conceivable difficulty to ultimate glorification Put on that helmet. There may also be storms of defeat where we fall into sin and dishonor our Lord and Savior. We can weather even those storms if we realize that Jesus died for us and he justified us and that by his grace we can be restored. And for all of us in Christ, our future is indeed certain. Put on that helmet. Hey, soon we'll all be home. Amen? Soon we'll all be home. Hope. Glory, put on that helmet. That's an anchor for us. But look, instead of our anchor falling into the depths, look, instead, our anchor as Christians rises up, 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 up into heaven where the Lord himself is. So our lives are accessed and anchored in heaven and we're as good as there already and that's vital to remember when the wily liar tries to sidetrack us and cause us to doubt and knock us down and knock us out. No. Put on that helmet of salvation and set your hope in what is coming for you, God's beloved child. Don't take your eyes off of that. Don't take your eyes off of that. The next piece of essential spiritual armor is the sword. The word for sword here isn't referring to those long swords that we would be wielded with two hands. No, instead, this refers to the shorter sword that was about two feet long that could be wielded with one hand and that was used for close hand-to-hand combat. Note that this is the only clearly offensive weapon in this list of armor, and like the other pieces of armor, this is absolutely vital. Here we see that the Word of God is our spiritual sword. Satan hates the Word of God. Doesn't that make you want to 
pick it up and read it and apply it because Satan hates it and God is greatly pleased when we do that. Sword of the Spirit, the sword given by the Spirit to us, not only does it help us in incredible ways, but it's also used to assault the wicked one, our wily enemy. The Bible, see, in your life is a weapon. And it's only a matter of whether you know how to use it or not. Learning how to use it is dependent upon how diligently you ingest it and read it and study it and live it out in your life. One said, we have a spiritual sword, a sword not forged in human anvils or tempered in earthly fires, a sword that has a divine origin, a powerful, effective, amazing weapon that is incomparable and matchless in the hand of a believer. It's so important and powerful that nothing can withstand it and nothing can overpower it, but we have to use it, see. Here we have this incredible WMD. I just made that up, you know. Right here. Many Christians don't even pick it up. <laughs> How foolish is that? We have to use it. Yet many Christians don't even read it. But it's impossible to stand firm and be a good soldier, or be a good wrestler if you don't. David tells us the importance of the Word of God in Psalm 19, 7 through 11. There he tells us that the Word of God is perfect. Perfect means complete, comprehensive, without defect or blemish. Whole, undefiled, of utmost integrity, sound, wholesome, the Word of God. In other words, the Word of God lacks nothing in order that it might be what it should be. It is complete as a revelation of divine truth, and it's complete as a rule of conduct. What else did David tell us? What else does David tell us? That the word of God is sure, it's certain, it's firm, it's dependable. This shows us that in a world of lies and in a world of uncertainty, we can stake our present and our future on God's testimony or witness concerning himself because his word is truth and therefore God's testimony is worthy of our trust. That means that anything that doesn't agree with God's word is a lie. That means that the Bible is to be our one and only standard for life. That means that the Bible is our one authority, and the wise soul is the one who submits to that authority, because it's true. Third, David tells us that God's word is right. Yashar, which means righteous, straight, upright, just, and correct. See, God's word is founded in righteousness, and so just as a physician gives the right medicine and a counselor gives the right advice, so does the book of God gives us, give us what is right, correct, truthful, and essential and needed for our souls. Fourth, David says God's word is pure. It's without hypocrisy or blemish. Unlike the other sacred books of so many other religions whose words are anything but pure and without pretense, God's word alone is pure, clean, radiant and without fault. You say, no, John, God's word is filled with contradictions. Oh, no, it's not. No, it's not. And while there are tensions that are hard for our human minds to comprehend, and while there are indeed some difficult passages, there are no contradictions in the Bible. And God's word is indeed coherent, consistent, and true because God is the one who wrote it through his divine inspiration. See, you don't have to be afraid to ask the hard questions of the Bible. No, ask them. Ask them. We have nothing to fear if it's true, and it's true. So ask the hard questions and watch as God's word passes every true test because it's true. Fifth, his word is clean. Clean means pure, genuine, flawless, free from impurity. As one wrote, God's word will never fade, corrode, or diminish because of impurity. It is clean, and it makes clean. That's right. See, because the Word of God is pure, it is then the means to cleanse our hearts and lives as dirty sinners. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So how is a dirty, undeserving sinner ever going to be made clean and right before God? Through His Word, by which His Spirit does His effective work. Through His Word, giving us the truth of God and the good news of Christ. Six, God's Word is true and righteous. True refers to faithfulness, reliability, and trustworthiness. 
while righteousness suggests conformity to a moral standard. And just as God is true and righteous, right, pure, holy, and untainted, so too is his perfect word that he has given to us. See, there's nothing false or unrighteous in his word, nothing. Instead, God has given us a book. Think about this. He's given us a perfect book that gives us everything that we need to know for life and for salvation forever. It's a gift. Pick it up and read it. And look, because all these things are true of the word of God, then the word brings true and lasting results. David in Psalm 19 tells us that the word converts the soul. The word for convert means to refresh, revive, and to restore. So we find that the word converts the sinner from his ways, and it also restores the saint when he wanders and is downcast. Don't we all need that? I need restoration. I need some encouragement. You get it from the word of God. Second, David tells us that God's word makes you truly wise. How the word of God is what moves us from being children to adults. The Hebrew word for wisdom means to be skilled in the practical aspects of holy living. And here we find that scripture is the source of that true wisdom. Third, David tells us that the word rejoices the heart. Rejoicing means to be glad and to delight in. And true joy comes only from God, and the way to God is found in his word. See, Fourth, the word enlightens the eyes. Satan's called the God of this world who blinds men and women in their sin and who darkens their understanding. However, the word of God brings light into that darkness, and it illuminates the right path and enables us to walk in that path without stumbling. See, the word of God purges out the darkness and thus enables us to see clearly and without distortion, first for salvation and then for abundant and meaningful life. Fifth, the word endures forever. So the word of God is lasting, as one noted. The word of God never needs to be edited. It never needs to be updated. It never needs to be refined. It's not uh, inadequate. It doesn't have errors. It doesn't have shortcomings that somehow need to be corrected. The Bible doesn't need to be bolstered. It is an eternal word, and it will dwell eternally in the glory of the eternal state unchanged. God's living word will never pass away, and that's absolutely correct. This is our spiritual sword. It's powerful, it's effective, it's living, it's active, and by it we can assault the wicked one. And also by it we can give great glory to God when we stand firm. So, read it. Read it, know it, study it, ingest it, memorize it, live it out. Make it your one rule for life and not your own opinions or the opinions of sinful humanity. No, make it your one rule for living and then go to war. Strap on the armor, keep it on, and stand firm and resolute. Good news, this isn't a losing battle, right? Not when we have our armor on and use it. Lord, help us. The preface of the Geneva Bible says this. The Bible is the light to our paths, the key of the kingdom of heaven, our comfort in affliction, our shield and sword against Satan, the school of all wisdom, the glass wherein we behold God's face, the testimony of his favor, and the only food and nourishment of our souls. That's absolutely correct. Hey, you've got a sword. You've got a sword. Pick it up and use it against the enemy. Strap on the armor, the girded waist, the breastplate, the shod feet, the shield, the helmet, and the sword. Strap on the armor. You're a saved child of God, and you have conviction and and passion for him. You're saved because of Christ and you're intent on living for his glory and in righteousness more and more. You rest in the peace, the shalom of God, even when trials and hardships abound. You trust God and remain faithful to him, knowing that he loves you and and that he's doing what's best. Your hope is set on what's waiting for you in glory, and that affects how you live today. And his word is your authority for life, and you do all you can to take it in and to live it out for the glory of God. That is is a good spiritual soldier, a true fighter for God, a a person who does damage to Satan's temporary and fading kingdom. And I say, let's go out and let's do some damage for the glory of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us to be strong 
spiritual warriors for you. Help us, Lord, to see and understand this armor and to strap it on every day or just to put it on and keep it on and never take it off. Help us to not listen to the lies of Satan when he tries to bring us down and knock us off course and ruin our witness and discourage our walk and so many other things. No, help us, Lord, to put on all the armor and to fight well and to stand strong and to be used mightily for your glory. May we wrestle well. May we fight well. Bless us. May we encourage one another in these truths. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Hope to see you at one. Thank you.